We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial. It's important for us to understand that the Oluru statement from the heart it is a statement that tells the truth about the past. What did the great James Baldwin say? That if we cannot tell ourselves the truth about our past, we become trapped by it. My name is Vicki Mora. I am from Innisfail, and my tribe is from the Atherton Tablelands, and it's the Nudjinji tribe from far north Queensland. I am a seafarer on the bauxite boats, ships that go from Gladstone to Weeper. And my union is Maritime Union of Australia. We've all come here from across this nation to talk to the politicians, to enshrine a voice in the constitution and to talk about our issues and what we face in everyday problems. Unions are our voice. And so that's how we can understand the importance of establishing this voice. We need to protect it in the rule book of the nation, the constitution. That's all it is, it's a rule book. So we're going to be meeting with the Labor caucus today. Labor is completely committed to the Uluru Statement and we recognise it in, in a very profound way. People still don't know what the voice is about. And one of the things you can be proud of in the Labor Caucus, but also the First Nations Caucus, is that we have stood strong for a voice to the Parliament from day one. There will be support for what the voice is really wanting to achieve. I went to Uluru with great hope, but there was also great tension. A lot of our people still thought that there was a conspiracy in this when in reality it was the result of our struggle to be asked what we want. Professor Megan Davis read the Uluru Statement from the heart for the first time. I think I was one of the last to stand up. I was just in so much shock. And I looked around the room and I saw people that had been in passionate debate against each other through the process, embracing each other with tears flowing down their faces so overwhelmed with the moment, a national consensus. Thomas was a natural at breaking down barriers and opening up to the opportunities. And when the Makarata statement was in its pioneering stages, Thomas just emerged. He was the guy for the job. Everybody said, this guy's got it and we, we need to get behind it. He became the voice. And I don't think there could have been a better person to do it. The Uluru Statement is actually a canvas. It's a beautiful artwork painted by Anangu law woman Rini Kulicha and several other Anangu women. This is a gift to the people, not the politicians, and the unions have been really supporting in ensuring that gift gets to the people. The unions strategically were really important in ensuring that the Uluru Statement went across the country and now you know people were able to touch the artwork they were able to read the artwork and that was a really emotive thing for people they were able to experience it in real life I'd been on the road for 12 months with the support of the MUA to build this movement for the Uluru Statement and I thought one of the most powerful things I could do was share with the Australian people some of the voices of the wonderful Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that I'd met around the country to help people to listen to the ordinary but extraordinary voices of our people that they wouldn't normally hear. The book is such an important tool in conveying the message to the people about the truth of Australian history and why a voice enshrined in the Constitution is so important about addressing unfinished business.
Thomas, uh, it's no good saying anything because mm -hmm. Thomas, in a way, has got this superb way of finding the truth. Everywhere I've gone, people get it, you know, the support is there. For some people, you know, they, they get really emotional. I find especially in the more remote communities, they, they really embrace the opportunity to have someone from their own community, from their own First Nation, come together with other nations. Um, I've travelled over 15 hours from my community of Kalkaringa in the Northern Territory. Um, I'm the member of... We are inviting the Australian people to support the reform for a First Nations voice. It's reasonable, it's doable, and it's the only option that First Nations have had a consensus on. So for politicians to then go and say, oh no, that's too much, is simply not an option now. You cannot recognise First Nations unless they have an input into that. And the Uluru Statement is that input and that mandate. The best way for proper reconciliation to happen is to have a voice enshrined in the Constitution and constitutional change that recognise Aboriginal people, not for 60,000 years, a lot, even a lot longer than that. Really, it's a representative body, and if anybody should understand that, it's us unionists. We understand the structure behind unity, the discipline, and the compromise amongst each other, you know, the consensus building. It's hard work, and right now, we don't have that. The book has been a very important tool to move the movement forward towards a referendum. Constitutional voice will require a referendum to enshrine it. And we're not naive enough to think that that's going to be easy. Only 8 out of 44 referendums have been successful in this country. Only 3% of the population are Indigenous. Less than that 3% of the population actually are enrolled to vote and are able to vote because of poverty or living in remote areas. All the social indicators in the last three or four years are bad, they're getting worse. So that's why we want a voice in the Parliament that is there and cannot be chucked out by an elected government. That's why it's so very important. It's a narrative that everybody can share and it's the opportunity of hope and coming together, walking a journey together. So, I want to end Uncle Kevin with something you said which was so many of our elders in the past had died with a broken heart. As a millennial, as a young First Nations woman, I refuse to let that be the fate of our people today. Secessions of Labour governments, secessions of Conservative governments has not dealt with the truth of its past. There's great rhetoric around it. But what are the political projects? How do we honor that past of First Nation people, the righteous past? Because we're going to fight for it, yeah? All right. Okay. We want a voice enshrined into the Constitution, and it is important to us that we are allowed to have a say in our rights, in our children, for their future. I think it goes to the way that laws are made in this country that the laws don't take into account the prejudice and the racism that we experience every day. The laws are made by mostly non-Indigenous men, mostly white men that have never experienced the racism that we experience. And it's one of the reasons why I think the Uluru Statement is so important. It calls for a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. And until we start to say what happens in our communities, until we start to have uh, uh, the influence on the laws to make sure that this is taken into account, then we're not going to see justice. Across this vast country, we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. So that's your